the accomplices of Citadella had sent him a messenger to inform him of my return, but he was detained by contrary winds. In the meantime, I set off, arrived at Fréjus, Grenoble, Auxerre, and did not stop until I reached Paris. I upset the directory. The 18th Brumaire occurred. The enemies of France were confounded. I restored order, recalled victory, and established the consulate government. But if winds had been favorable, if the dispatches to Citadella had arrived before me, all my plans might have been defeated, and France from that moment would have become prey to the emigrants. Napoleon had often spoken to me of the intrigues which had agitated his reign and accomplished at last his downfall. He was acquainted with them all, knew the leaders, their accomplices, and the places where they met. During the hundred days, I followed their movements, said he. I saw them run from my presence to their assemblies, and I might have punished, for I held the documents which convicted them. These documents had reached me in a singular manner. A foreign officer of rank whose situation obliged him to listen to these plots was indignant on seeing men whom I had created conspire to effect my ruin. He demanded an audience, delivered up all the plans to me, and protested. And if ever his troops should be in the line of battle, I might reckon upon him. I was deeply affected and was on the point of casting these wretches back into the mire from which I had raised them. But the crisis approached. It was necessary to conquer. And I postponed this signal act of national justice until after the enemy should be defeated. The enemy, however, was not defeated. Measures were too well concerted. And I fell. Ah, doctor, how many contemptible beings surrounded me. But if fortune had not betrayed her courage... If we had conquered at Waterloo, everything would have been repaired and revenged. The nation would have been put in possession of the secret of our disasters, and I should have offered an expiatory sacrifice to the maids of my soldiers. What have these wretches done? They were satiated with glory, and they have covered themselves with opprobrium. But every action meets with its due reward. For who would be Monsieur A? He named several individuals and stopped at S. Beast miscreant, said he. He betrayed me with all the turpitude natural to men of his caste. After having made his own terms, he ran front and blow, represented to me his situation and his misery. I divided with him what remained in my chest, gave him a thousand accuse, and he left me apparently agitated by every feeling of gratitude. A few afterwards, he had gone over to the Austrians. From the plots of these last periods, the emperor passed to those that were formed at the commencement of his career and spoke at length of the machinations, which had interfered with his operations during the campaigns of Italy. He related how he had discovered and defeated them, and the light that had been thrown upon the movements of the interior by the papers he had seized at Padua and Verona. His correspondence had given me some insight into all these intrigues. I had a general idea of them, but their details escaped me, and I could not understand many of the principal documents. There are some from you, sire, from Ogaro, from Bernadotte. I see that you had guessed Willow, that you would not have. Men who only love liberty to lead them to revolutions that you gave orders at. Some individuals should not be allowed to style themselves people and commit crimes in its name. You say in one of your dispatches, revolutionists are detested here. And all are ready to oppose them, whatever their object may be. No more revolutions. That is the dearest hope of the soldier. He does not ask for peace, which is the object of his secret wishes, because he knows that it would be the only way not to obtain it. And that those who dread peace call for it loudly in order that it may not take place. The soldier is preparing for fresh battles, and if he sometimes turns his eyes towards some towns of the interior and observes the spirit which animates them, he is great to see deserters received and protected, and the laws without efficacy at a moment, which is to decide the fate of the French nation. In other place, you ask for officers accustomed to fight. You will not have generals skilled in scientific retreats. You exclaim, that you can only be overcome by disproportionate numbers. That perhaps the last moment of the brave Ogaro of the intrepid Messina, of Berthier, and of blank is approaching. I understand. 
I trace the existence of malevolence and imbecility in the choice of officers and in the state of abandonment in which you were left, but nothing escaped you. You spoke openly, and they took care not to commit themselves. The emigrants impeded the transports and escaped courage spies but the army was devoted and only lived for france and victory but what signifies the proclamation of ogaro what proclamation read it to me soldiers what have i heard can it be that those arms which in your hands have become the terror of europe and the triumph of the Republic, those victorious arms which you had devoted to the most sacred causes and which were once so formidable to the enemies of your country are now turned against her by yourselves, that your hands are stained with French blood and that you have polluted by fratricides the laurels with which you were crowned. What evil genius has sown discord amongst you? Who has fanned its fire? Who? has spread its poison. I have seen my country threatened from abroad, betrayed at home, torn by civil war, tormented by factions, invaded at its frontiers, and prey to all the horrors of anarchy. I have seen all my fellow citizens driven in contrary directions by opposite parties flock under the banners of each in turn, murdering one day in the name of justice and the next in the name of humanity. I have seen all the crimes of intolerance, fanaticism, and ambition, and I have shuddered. But in the midst of all these disorders, my eyes were turned towards the army, where I saw union, concord, and fraternity. There all hatred and passion disappeared before the sacred fire, patriotism, and honor leagued together for the defense of all. I admired the sublime example of zeal, constancy, and devotedness it displayed, and I said, it's virtue. Liberty and heroism are banished from the rest of the universe. It is there in the Republican army that they have a sure asylum. That consoling reflection has constantly upheld me in the most violent crisis. I felt proud of being in your ranks. Oh, comrades, will you oblige me to alter my opinion? No, you know that I'm your friend. My voice has often guided you to victory. Obey the impulse it now seeks to give you. Let us argue. A single word is the cause of your dissensions. How absurd! You believe yourselves really divided in opinion, but you are mistaken. You will think alike. When you pursued your victorious course from the Pyrenees to the banks of the Danube and from the ocean to the banks of the Tiber, what was your object? To be free? You are free. You possess laws and rights. In a word, you are Citizens, this title has been dearly bought and ought therefore to be dearly valued, and yet either from levity or love of novelty, an unmeaning, barbarous, unharmonious name, a name without etymology after having been prescribed by good sense, has been revived by folly, and fashion has undertaken to bring it into vogue once more. That fashion has crossed the Alps, and our ears have been offended by the whistling sound of Monsieur. I am far from suspecting those who have used the word of any bad intention, and I attribute their having done so to a want of reflection. I know my countrymen. At first, monsieur has been said without attaching any importance to it. Those who have been displeased with the expression have perhaps required in too haughty a tone that it should be banished from the intercourse of society, and it has then been thought that compliance with the interdiction might be ascribed to fear. All that is quite enough to produce obstinacy on both sides, but it is enough to justify hatred and destruction. I have bought as dearly as anyone the valuable title of citizen, and I am disposed to submit to every sacrifice to preserve it. Who amongst you thinks differently? Nobody, I hope. If there are any that do, let them go and carry elsewhere their baseness and their maxims. Their departure will be the signal for the return of harmony and union amongst the worthy defenders of our country. You are now approaching the moment when you will enjoy the reward of your labors. Peace will enable government to compensate your sufferings. And I, who have been constantly witnessed all the that you have been exposed to and all the efforts you have made. I, who know your wants and wish to supply them, am already preparing at Verona the means of accomplishing that object on your arrival there. Dress, equipment, 
arms, food, hospitals, and pay have all been the subject of my earnest solicitude. And you will feel its effects, but I expect from you the oblivion of those dissensions which grieve my heart and cause our enemies to smile. Let the love of your country and the honor of the army produce a reconciliation so that when I shall appear again at your head, I may find no more traces of what has happened. I trust that these motives are powerful enough to bring you back to sentiments more worthy of yourselves, and that you will not oblige me, after having tried persuasion, to have recourse to force. Order. General Oguro, considering that malevolence ever ready to seize opportunities of doing harm, has taken advantage of the word monsieur being used in conversation or elsewhere to sow discord and produce confusion. And that the blood required for the defense of our country has been shed in the quarrels that have followed its adoption, considering also that after what has occurred, those who should obstinately persist in using that word can have no other object in view than the total ruin of the army, declares that henceforth any individual of the division who shall use the word monsieur, either verbally or in writing, under any pretense whatever, shall be degraded and rendered incapable of serving in the armies of the republic. The present order shall be inserted in the order of the day and read at the head of each company. Ogro. What? Degrade a man for a single word? Why not? If that word produces bloodshed, as it did. Bernadotte had gone from the army of the Rhine to that of Italy. His troops had appeared cold, stiff, and lukewarm, and had become the object of the jokes and sarcasms of the corps commanded by Messena. Anger ensued, the names of Monsieur and saint Culot were reciprocally given, and bloodshed followed, such as the disorder which Ogaro wished to repress, and his proclamation gives a faithful picture of the circumstances in which we were placed. Attempts are now made to falsify history. Men capable of appreciating our labors endeavor to turn the current of opinion. But the facts speak for themselves, and they must at last be understood. It was not in the army of Italy that our enemies sought for traitors. From the moment it was commanded by Napoleon, the emigrants could not find in its ranks anybody to seduce. The religion of its banners was the only one known. We marched and everything vanished before us. Italy was conquered and Austria reduced to the last extremity. We were striking the aristocracy blow after blow. Its existence was threatened. And in its own defense, it is spied and seized upon every opportunity of retaliation. A victory only produced fresh battles. Firms who came to avenge Beaulieu, Alvinzi to avenge Worms, or the army of the Rhine, which was forever on the point of marching, never moved. The question was between us and them, and was soon decided. Success crowned valor, and we triumphed in every direction. The general-in-chief advanced through Tyrol, penetrated into Carinthia, and drove everything before him. He had made dispositions to be able to support his movement and prevent the enemy from intercepting us. Every chance was foreseen. Having reached Klagenfurt and taken the offensive, he directed his troops to the right and refused his left, which was protected by various works. I proposed, said the emperor, to occupy Salzburg and Innsbruck, to cross the inn, to levy contributions on the suburbs of the capital, and march into Bavaria. The army of the Rhine again remained inactive, and the plan failed. If Moreau had chosen to cooperate with me, we should have made the most astonishing campaign that ever was fought. We should have upset Europe, but he went to Paris, did nothing, attempted nothing, and left me once more to cope with all the forces of the Austrian monarchy. I had penetrated into Germany without the least consideration. I had taken 80,000 prisoners and obliged the emperor to evacuate Vienna, but immense levies of troops were being raised in all directions. Hungary was flying to arms. The Tyrol was on fire. My position was very critical. I there Therefore, had recourse to negotiation. The departments of the war and Marie and the whole administration, in short, was supported by his victories. He was obliged to supply the wants of the other armies, to secure the pay of the troops, to furnish horses, to satisfy every claim.
in the space of a few months. He had sent 52 millions into France. On the other hand, the directory had attached to our rear a host of rascals who devoured everything our soldiers were without shoes, money, or clothes, and the hospitals were destitute of the most essential articles. We were assailed by scarcity in the midst of plenty. It was in vain that he represented, threatened, assembled. Military commissions drew bills. The commissions were seduced and the bills dishonored. He was alone to combat corruption. It was like the task of forcing a torrent back to its source. There was but one way of putting an end to this state of things, which was to establish a commission possessing the power of inflicting the punishment of death on these pirates. The policy of the measure was confirmed by experience in history and consistent with the nature of the government, but it was not to be expected that the depredators themselves would deliver up the sword, which was to strike them. The proposal was rejected. Everything was exhausted. He no longer knew where to apply and was besides aware of his political position. He therefore signed the preliminaries of Loben. A question was now to pass from provisional to definitive conditions and lay down the basis of a permanent peace. But the Democrats did not wish for peace, and the aristocrats still less. The first were anxious to municipalize Europe, and the second waited to see the result of the plots they had formed. The emperor will not sign, wrote confidentially the elector of Hesse. Clichy is averse to these transactions, and Clichy rules over Paris and its councils. The affair is therefore suspended for the present. These delays did not suit either my ideas or my views. I had seized the papers of the party at Verona and had just got possession of its papers in Venice. I discovered its plans, its means, the information it possessed, and I knew that corruption prevailed everywhere and that all were seduced and ready to betray their trust. In desperate cases, violent remedies must be applied. I appealed to the patriotism of the troops. We framed an address. Oguro carried it. And the club was confounded. Bernadette also contributed a great deal to defeat the plot. I had sent him to the directory. He ran to the Minesh, harangued, speechified, and struck all the emigrants with terror. But the collection must contain some of his letters. Look, after the affair of Venice, I opened the book and read. I laugh at the extravagance of the partisans of royalty. They must possess very little knowledge of those who lead the armies and of the armies themselves to hope to muzzle them so easily or to believe that an orator more or less learned more or less venal, can disturb our tranquility. Those deputies who speak with so much impertinence are far from imagining that we should enslave Europe if you only formed the project of so doing. 